because of the fact that that particular transformation she <laughs> because of the fact that that tran <laughs> I can't talk because of the fact that that trans <sighs> Done. That's it. Quit. <laughs> hey there, creepy peeps. Today we are talking about the howling. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about the howling directed by Joe Dante, who is like the staple name a staple name who's a big name in the horror genre um this is actually <sighs> the second or third movie i've seen i am not only the second um the only other movie i've seen that he's directed is gremlins so <laughs> he's got a good mix um he's got a good mix of horror and non-horror movies that he's directed, so that's cool. Um, but The Howling is about a TV news anchor. The Howling is about a TV news anchor, Karen, who is, well, when the movie opens, um, she is in the process of kind of like luring a stalker who has been harassing her. Um, and they meet in this, porn theater store type place where he transforms into a werewolf in front of her when the police bust in and shoot him and all that and she's so traumatized she kind of forgets what happens and she's sent to this like community in the mountains where she is supposed to be recuperating and regaining her memories to figure out what happened because she can't remember. So of course when she gets up into the mountains slowly start to unravel the fact that all of the members of that community up there are werewolves. This movie to me feels like a little, it feels a little more modern even though it came out in 1981. It just feels, it feels like something we would see today. I feel like it was a little more sexually charged than a lot of other werewolf movies from that time. Um, in particular, uh, American Werewolf in London. Mind you, which did have sex, but The Howling seems a little more sexually charged and some of the transformations are even kind of brought on from having sex or during sexual pleasure you know what I mean so it feels a little bit more modern like that feels something <laughs> that feels like something we would watch today like on Teen Wolf or something I don't know is that what that show is called the one on MTV I've never seen it uh, so this movie came out about the same time as American Werewolf in London and a lot of the effects looked really familiar when I was watching them because of course a big part of any werewolf movie is the transformation scene when we finally see our either protagonist usually protagonist in this case it's our antagonist um that transforms into a werewolf um and that's always a big scene um in american werewolf in london it's a very now iconic scene because that transformation scene was filmed with bright lights shining down on it and next to no jump cuts at all. So <clears throat> it's very impressive for that time because it was all practical effects and puppetry and things <clears throat> and makeup effects that created that transformation. So when I was watching the transformation scene, the big transformation scene in Howling, I noticed that it kind of looked familiar. I was like, why do I feel like I've seen this before? Uh, <laughs> it's not just because it came out around the same time as American Werewolf in London, it's because of the person who was responsible for the transformation scene. 
what? I can't, every time I say transformation and scene together, it turns into transformation machine. Okay, so the reason why it looks so familiar is because Rick Baker was supposed to be in charge of the special effects makeup on The Howling. He left the project to go do American Werewolf in London and his assistant, Rob Botton, his assistant took over on The Howling and I feel like that's why they looked so similar. Uh, <laughs> so it's really interesting. You kind of have the very familiar profile shot where the snout like in real time kind of grows out from the face, which is always very cool. Uh, <laughs> again, don't see that a lot nowadays because it's all CGI. Nobody appreciates being able to actually grow a snout on somebody's face and have it like in real time come out from your face. The lost art, guys, the lost art. <laughs> I grow a snout and ears and fur all the time. <sighs> but it was normal. So at the end of this movie is where I guess a little interesting. I guess Karen and Chris, that's the name. Karen and Chris. Uh, Chris is also works at the movie station with Karen. Um, they're escaping the community and, but not before Karen is bitten, trying to fight her way out. So that's an interesting point when we get to that and we're like, oh no, they almost made it out. What's gonna happen? So it cuts to Karen doing a news broadcast and she transforms on screen while informing the public on werewolves and that they're very real and they live among us. She transforms on screen and then Chris kills her, uh, which was their plan. Um, <laughs> but interestingly, she turns into like this like wear poodle kind of thing. Like she looks like, she looks like if like a regular house dog got bitten by a werewolf and transformed. <laughs> like a humanoid kind of house dog, uh, which is interesting. I wonder if that means that when you're bitten, you turn into like a dog that matches your personality because it looked like all the other werewolves in the community looked the same when they transformed. Does that mean they were all like malicious and evil or something? And she was more like fluffy and cute. Demonic 